Phantasmagoria by Lewis Carroll Canto One, The Tristy One winter night at half-past nine, cold, tired, and cross, and muddy, I had come home too late to dine, and supper with cigars and wine was waiting in the study. There was a strangeness in the room, and something, white and wavy, was standing near me in the gloom. I took it for the carpet-broom, left by that careless slavey. But presently the thing began to shiver and to sneeze, on which I said, Come, come, my man, that a most inconsiderate plan, less noise there, if you please. I've caught a cold, the thing replies, out there upon the landing. I, I turned to look in some surprise, and there before my very eyes a little ghost was standing. He trembled when he caught my eye and got behind a chair. How came you here? I said, and why? I never saw a thing so shy. Come out, don't shiver there. He said, I'll gladly tell you how, and also tell you why. But, here he gave a little bow, you're in so bad a temper now, you think it all a lie. And as to being in a fright, allow me to remark that ghosts have just as good a right in every way to fear the light as men fear the dark. No plea, said I, can well excuse such cowardice in you, for ghosts can visit when they choose, whereas we humans can't refuse to grant the interview. He said, a flutter of alarm is not unnatural, is it? I only feared you really meant some harm, but now I see that you are calm. Let me explain my visit. Houses are classed, I beg to state, according to the number of ghosts that they accommodate. The tenant merely counts his weight with coals and other lumber. This is a one-ghost house, and you, when you arrived last summer, may have remarked a spectra who was doing all that ghosts can do to welcome the newcomer. In villas this is always done, however cheaply rented, for though of course there's less fun when there is only room for one, ghosts have to be contented. That spectra left you on the third, since then you've not been haunted, for as he never sent us word, t'was quite by accident we heard that any one was wanted. A spectra has first choice by right in filling up a vacancy, then phantom, goblin, elf, and sprite, if all of these fail, them they invite the nicest ghoul that they can see. The spectra said the place was low and that you kept bad wine, so as a phantom had to go, and I was first, of course, you know, I couldn't well decline. No doubt, said I, they settled on who was fittest to be sent, yet still to choose a brat like you to haunt a man of forty-two was no great compliment. I'm not so young, sir, he replied, as you might think, the fact is, caverns by the waterside and other places that i've tried i've had a lot of practice but i have never taken yet a strict domestic part and in my flurry i forget the five good rules of etiquette we have to know by heart my sympathies were warming fast towards the little fellow he was so utterly aghast at having found a man at last and looked so scared and yellow at least i said I'm glad to find a ghost is not a dumb thing, but pray sit down, you'll feel inclined, if like myself you have not dined, to take a snack of something, though certainly you don't appear a thing to offer food to, and then I shall be glad to hear, if you will say them loud and clear, the rules that you allude to. Thanks, you shall hear them by and by. This is a piece of luck. What may I offer you? said I. Well, since you are so kind, I'll try a little bit of duck. One slice, and may I ask you for another drop of gravy? I sat and looked at him in awe, for certainly I never saw a thing so white and wavy. And still he seemed to grow more white, more vapory, and wavier, seen in the dim and flickering light as he, as he proceeded to recite his maxims of behavior. Canto to His Five Rules My first, but don't suppose, he said, I'm setting you a riddle, is, if your victim is in bed, don't touch the curtains at his head, but take them in the middle, 
and wave them slowly in and out while drawing them asunder and in a minute's time no doubt he'll raise his head and look about with eyes of wrath and wonder and here you must on no pretense make the first observation wait for the victim to commence no ghost of any common sense begins a conversation if he should say how came you here the way you began sir in such case your course is clear on the bat's back my little dear is the appropriate answer if after this he says no more you'd best perhaps curtail your exertions go and shake the door and then if he begins to snore you'll know the thing's a failure by day if he should walk alone at home or on a walk you merely give a hollow groan to indicate the kind of tone in which you mean to talk but if you find him with his friends the thing is rather harder in such a case success depends on picking up some candle ends or butter in the larder with this you make a kind of slide it answers best with sweet on which you must contrive to glide and swing yourself from side to side one learns how to do it the second tells us what is right in the ceremonious calls first burn a candle or a crimson light a thing i quite forgot tonight then scratch the door or walls i said you'll visit here no more if you attempt the guy i'll have no bonfires on my floor and as for scratching at the door i'd like to see you try the third was written to protect the interest of the victim and tells us as i recollect to treat him with grave respect and not to contradict him that's plain said i as tear and tret to any comprehension i only wish some ghost i've met would not so constantly forget the maxim that you mention perhaps he said you first transgressed the laws of hospitality all ghosts instinctively to test the man that fails to treat his guest with proper cordiality if you address a ghost as thing or strike him with a hatchet he is permitted by the king to drop all formal parleying and then you're sure to catch it the fourth prohibits trespassing where other ghosts are quartered and those convicted of the thing unless they're pardoned by the king must instantly be slaughtered that simply means be cut up small ghosts soon unite anew the process scarcely hurts at all no more than when you're what you call cut up by a review the fifth is one you may prefer that i should quote entire the king must be addressed as sir this from a simple courtier is all the laws require but should you wish to do the thing without and out politeness accost him as my goblin king and always use in answering the phrase your royal whiteness i'm getting rather hoarse i fear after so much reciting so if you don't object my dear we'll try a glass of bitter beer i think it looks inviting canto three scarmanges and did you really walk said i on such a wretched night i've always fancied ghosts could fly if not exactly in the sky yet at a fairish height it's very well said he for kings to soar above the earth but phantoms often find that wings like many other pleasant things cost more than they are worth spectres of course are rich and so can buy them from the elves but we prefer to keep below their stupid company you know for any but themselves for though they claim to be exempt from pride they treat a phantom as if something quite beneath contempt just as no turkey ever dreamt of noticing a bantam they seem too proud said i to go to houses such as mine pray how did they contrive to know so quickly that the place was low and that i kept bad wine inspector kobold came to you the little ghost began here i broke in inspector who inspecting ghost is something new explain yourself my man his name is kobold said my guest one of the spectre order you'll very often see him dressed in a yellow gown a crimson vest and a nightcap with a border 
He tried the Brocken business first, He caught a sort of chill, So came to England to be nursed, And here it took the form of thirst, Which he complains of still. Port wine, he says, when rich and sound, Warms his bones like nectar, And as the inns where it is found Are his especial hunting ground, We call him the Inn Spectra. I bore it, bore it like a man, this agonizing witticism, and nothing could be sweeter than my temper till the ghost began some most provoking criticism. Cooks need not be indulged in waste, yet still you'd better teach them. Dishes have some sort of taste. Pray why are all the cruets placed where nobody can reach them? That man of yours will never earn his living as a waiter. Is that queer thing supposed to burn? It's far too dismal a concern to call a moderator. The duck was tender, but the peas were very much too old. And just remember, if you please, the next time you have toasted cheese, don't let them send it cold. You'll find the bread improved, I think, by getting better flour, and have you anything to drink that looks a little less like ink and isn't quite so sour. Then peering round with curious eyes, he muttered, Goodness gracious, and so went on to criticize, Your room's an inconvenient size, it's neither snug nor spacious. That narrow window, I expect, serves but to let the dusk in. But please, said I, to recollect, t'was fashioned by an architect who's pinned his faith on Ruskin. I don't care who he was, sir, or on whom he pinned his faith. Constructed by whatever law, so poor a job I never saw, as I'm a living wraith. What a remarkable cigar! How much are they a dozen? I growled, no matter what they are, you're getting as familiar as if you were my cousin. Now that's a thing I will not stand, and so I tell you flat. Aha, said he, we're getting grand, taking a bottle in his hand. I'll soon arrange for that. And here he took careful aim, and gaily cried, Here goes! I tried to dodge it as it came, but somehow caught it all the same, exactly on my nose. And I remember nothing more than I can clearly fix, till I was sitting on the floor repeating, Two and five are four, but five and two are six. What really passed I never learned, nor guessed, I only know, that when at last my sense returned, the lamp neglected, dimly burned, the fire was getting low. Through driving mist I seemed to see a thing that smirked and smiled, and found that he was giving me a lesson in biography, as if I were a child. Canto Four, His Nurture Oh, when I was a little ghost, a merry time had we, each seated on his favorite post, we chumped and chawed the butter toast they gave us for our tea. That story is in print, I cried. Don't say it's not, because it's known as well as Bradshaw's Guide. The ghost uneasily replied. He hardly thought it was. It's not a nursery rhymes, and yet I almost think it is. Three little ghostesses were set on a postesses, you know, and ate their buttered toastesses. I have the book, so if you doubt it, I turned to search the shelf. Don't stir, he cried. We'll do without it. I now remember all about it. I wrote the thing myself. It came out in a monthly, or at least my agent said it did. Some literary swell who saw it seemed to think it adapted for the magazine he edited. My father was a brownie, sir. My mother was a fairy. The notion had occurred to her that children would be happier if they were taught to vary. The notion soon became a craze, and when it once begun she brought us all out in different ways. One was a pixie, two were fays, another was a banshee. The fetch and kelpie went to school and gave a lot of trouble. Next came a poltergeist and ghoul, and then two trolls, which broke the rule, a goblin and a double. If that's a snuff-box on the shelf, he added with a yawn, I'll take a pinch. Next came an elf, and then a phantom, that's myself, and last a leprechaun. One day some spectres chanced the call, dressed in the usual white. I stood and watched them in the hall, and couldn't make them out at all. They seemed so strange a sight. 
I wondered what on earth they were. They looked all head and sack, but mother told me not to stare, and then she twitched me by the hair and punched me in the back. Since then I've often wished that I had been a spectre born, but what's the use? He heaved a sigh. They are a ghost nobility, and on us they look with scorn. My phantom life was soon begun when I was barely six. I went out with an older one, and just at first I thought it was fun and learned a lot of tricks. I've haunted dungeons, castles, towers, wherever I was sent. I've often sat and howled for hours, drenched to the skin with driving showers upon a battlement. It's quite old-fashioned now to groan when you speak. This is the newest thing in tone, and here it chilled me to the bone. He gave an awful squeak. Perhaps, he added, to your ear, that sounds an easy thing. Try it yourself, my little dear. It took me something like a year with constant practicing. And when you've learned to squeak, my man, and caught the double sob, you're pretty much where you began. Just try and gibber if you can. That's something like a job. I've tried it and can only say, I'm sure you couldn't do it, even if you practiced night and day, unless you have a turn that way and natural ingenuity. Shakespeare, I think it is, who treats of ghosts in days of old, who gibbered in the Roman streets, dressed, if you recollect, in sheets, they must have found it cold. I've often spent ten pounds on stuff in dressing as a double, but though it answers as a puff, it never has effect enough to make it worth the trouble. Long bills soon quench the little thirst I had for being funny. The setting up is always worse. Such heaps of things you want at first, one must be made of money. For instance, take a haunted tower with skull, crossbones, and sheet. Blue lights to burn, say, to an hour. Condensing lens of extra power and set of chains complete. What with the things you have to hire, the fitting on the robe, and testing all the colored fire, the outfit of itself would tire the patience of a job. And then they're so fastidious, the haunted house committee, I've often known them to make a fuss because a ghost was French or Russ, or even from the city. Some dialects are objected to, for one the Irish brogue is, and then for all you have to do, one pound a week they offer you, and find yourself in bogies. Canto five, Bickermint Don't they consult the victims, though? I said. They should by rights give them a chance, because you know the taste of people differ so, especially in sprites. The phantom shook his head and smiled. Consult them? Not a bit. T'would be a job to drive one wild, to satisfy one single child. There'd be no end to it. Of course you can't leave children free, said I, to pick and choose, but in the case of men like me, I think mine host might be fairly allowed to state his views. He said, it really wouldn't pay, folk are so full of fancies, we visit for a single day, and whether then we go or stay depends on the circumstances. And though we don't consult mine host, before the thing's arranged, still if he often quits his post, or is not a well-mannered ghost, then you can have him changed. But if the host's a man like you, I mean a man of sense, and if the house is not too new, why, what has that, said I, to do with a ghost's convenience? A new house does not suit, you know, it's such a job to trim it, but after twenty years or so the wainscotings begin to go, so twenty is the limit. To trim was not a phrase I could remember having heard. Perhaps, I said, you'll be so good as to tell me what is understood exactly by that word. It means the loosening all the doors, the ghost replied and laughed. It means the drilling by scores in all the skirting boards and floors to make a thorough draught. You'll sometimes find that one or two are all you really need to let the wind come listening through, but here there'll be a lot to do. I faintly gasped. Indeed! If I had been rather later, I'll be bound. I added, trying most unsuccessfully to smile. You'd been busy all this while, trimming and beautifying? Why, no, said he. Perhaps I should have stayed another minute. But still no ghost that's any good, without any introduction, would have ventured to begin it. The proper thing, as you were late, 
was certainly to go, but with the roads in such a state, I got the night mayor's leave to wait for half an hour or so. Who's the night mayor? I cried, instead of answering my question. Well, if you don't know that, he said, either you never go to bed or you've a grand digestion. He goes about and sits on folk that eat too much at night. His duties are to pinch and poke and squeeze them till they nearly choke. I said, it serves them right. And folk who sup on things like these, he muttered, eggs and bacon, lobster and duck and toasted cheese. If they don't get an awful squeeze, I'm very much mistaken. He is immensely fat, and so well suits the occupation. In point of fact, if you must know, we used to call him years ago the mayor and corporation. The day he was elected mayor, I know that every sprite meant to vote for me, but did not dare. He was so frantic with despair and furious with excitement. When it was over, for a whim, he ran to tell the king, and being the reverse of slim, a two-mile trot was not for him a very easy thing. So to reward him for his run, as it was baking hot and he was over twenty stone, the king proceeded, half in fun, to knight him on the spot. "'Twas a great liberty to take. I fired up like a rocket. "'He did it just for punning's sake. The man,' says Johnson, "'that would make a pun would pick a pocket.' A man, said he, is not a king. I argued for a while and did my best to prove the thing, the phantom merely listening with a contemptuous smile. At last, when breath and patience spent, I had recourse to smoking. Your aim, he said, is excellent, but when you call it an argument, of course you're only joking. Stung by his cold and snaky eye, I roused myself at length, to say, at least I do defy the very skeptic to deny that union is strength. That's true enough, said he, yet stay. I listened in all meekness. Union is strength, I'm bound to say. In fact, the thing's as clear as day, but onions are a weakness. Canto six, Discomfiture As one who strives a hill to climb who never climbed before, who finds it in a little time, grow every moment less sublime, and votes the thing a bore, yet having once begun to try, dares not desert his quest, but climbing ever keeps his eye on one small hut against the sky, wherein he hopes to rest, who climbs till nerve and force are spent with many a puff and pant, who still as rises the ascent, and language grows more violent, although in breath more scant who climbing gains at length the place that crowns the upward track, and entering with unsteady pace receives a buffet in the face that lands him on his back, and feels himself like one in sleep, glides swiftly down again, a helpless weight from steep to steep, till with a headlong giddy sweep he drops upon the plain. So I, that had resolved to bring conviction to a ghost, and found it quite a different thing from any human arguing, yet dared not quit my post. But keeping still the end in view to which I hoped to come, I strove to prove the matter true by putting everything I knew into an axiom, commencing every single phrase with therefore or because, I blindly reeled a hundred ways about the syllogistic maze, unconscious where I was. Quoth he, that's a regular claptrap, don't bluster any more. Now do be cool and take a nap, such a ridiculous old chap was never seen before. You're like a man I used to meet who got one day so furious in arguing the simple heat, scorched both his slippers off his feet. I said, that's very curious. Well, it is curious, I agree, and sounds perhaps like fibs, but still it's true as true can be, as sure your name is Tibbs, said he. I said, my name's not Tibbs. Not Tibbs, he cried. His tone became a shade or two less hearty. Why, no, said I, my proper name is Tibbets. Tibbets? I the same. Why, then, you're not the party. With that he struck the board a blow that shivered half the glasses. Why couldn't you have told me so three quarters of an hour ago, you prince of all the asses? 
to walk four miles through mud and rain to spend the night in smoking and then to find that it's in vain and i've to do it all again it's really too provoking don't talk he cried as i began to mutter some excuse who can have patience with a man that's got no more discretion than an idiotic goose to keep me waiting here instead of telling me at once that this was not the house he said there that'll do be off to bed don't gape like that you dunce it's very fine to throw the blame on me in such a fashion why didn't you inquire my name the very minute that you came i answered in a passion of course it worries you a bit to come so far on foot but how is i to blame for it well well said he i must admit that isn't badly put and certainly you've given me the best of wine and victual excuse my violence said he but accidents like this you see they put one out a little twas my fault after all i find shake hands old turnip top the name was hardly to my mind but as no doubt he meant it kind i let the matter drop good night old turnip top good night when i am gone perhaps they'll send you some inferior sprite who'll keep you in some constant fright and spoil your soundest naps tell him you'll stand no sort of trick then if he leers and chuckles you'll just be handy with a stick mine that's pretty hard and thick and rap him on the knuckles then carelessly remark old coon perhaps you're not aware that if you don't behave you'll soon be chuckling to another tune so you'd best take care that's the right way to cure a sprite of such like goings on but gracious me it's getting light good night old turnip top good night nod and he was gone canto seven sad sovenance what's this i pondered have i slept or can i have been drinking but soon a gentler feeling crept upon me and i sat and wept an hour or so like winking no need for bones to hurry so i sobbed in fact i doubt if it was worth his while to go and who is tibbs i'd like to know to make such work about if tibbs is anything like me it's possible i said he won't be over pleased to be dropped in upon at half past three after he's snug in bed and if bones plagues him anyhow squeaking and all the rest of it and he was doing here just now i prophesy there'll be a row and tibbs will have the best of it then as my tears could never bring the friendly phantom back it seemed to me the proper thing to mix another glass and sing the following coronet and art thou gone beloved ghost best of familiars nay then farewell my duckling rose farewell farewell my tea and toast my meerschaum and cigars the hues of life are dull and grey the sweets of life insipid when thou my charmer art away old brick or rather let me say old parallelopite instead of singing verse the third i ceased abruptly rather but after such a splendid word i felt that if it would be absurd to try it any farther so with a yawn i went my way to seek the welcome downy and slept and dreamed till break of day of poltergeist and fetch and fay and leprechaun and brownie for a year i've not been visited by any kind of sprite yet still they echo in my head those parting words so kindly said old turnip top good night End of Phantasmagora by Lewis Carroll Read by Dorian Gray